Ronnie Coleman is an eight-time Mr. Olympia who is an absolute legend in the world of bodybuilding, who is best known for achieving monumental feats of strength that no one else was able to do at that time. But how did this incredible athlete go from top of his career to 13 low back surgeries and years of pain to follow? In today's episode 121 of the Low Back Pain Podcast, we are going to discuss his story and where it might have all went wrong. Now let's get into Ronnie's recap of exactly where this journey began. When did you start having back problems? You know what, I herniated my disc. Well, I hurt my back in high school, actually. And then I hurt it real bad playing football. I mean, I hurt it so bad playing football that I had to go to chiropractor. He had to work on me for like every single day. Now, 80% of human beings alive will experience low back pain at some point in their life, and a very high risk factor for low back pain is previous occurrences of lower back pain. So what Ronnie is now describing is a previous occurrence earlier in his life in his high school years. My whole college career, I, I went to a chiropractor just about every single day. Now here Ronnie is describing how he had to frequent his chiropractor almost every day for what sounds to be months or even years. What I would consider this is to be maybe not the most effective treatment, seeing as though he had to continue to go back all the time. We know that rehabilitation is going to provide longer lasting results when combined with spinal manipulation. So as I preach on here a lot, if you're continuing to do something and you have to keep going back in order to feel good, it probably isn't the best thing for long-term relief and you probably need something different that's going to teach you how to take control of your own situation. It always hurt me when I work out. It, it would bother me from time to time when I wasn't working out. So at this point, most people will find that in the earlier stages of their injury, they have to stress their body in order to push it to the point where they start to feel it. A lot of our clients will say when they do a leg workout or when they run, or when they push themselves at work, they'll start to feel it. But as the injury progresses, they'll start to notice it in their normal life as well, even when they're sedentary or just sitting at their job. This is when things start to cascade down a worse path. The the worst injury ever, I was uh, taken off for the uh, after an Olympia a couple weeks, you know, and I went back to squatting and working out. So what Ronnie just described is that after a Mr. Olympia competition, he took a few weeks off of training. This is setting up a very common story where many people will take a brief period of time away from lifting, but away from exercise in general. What this sets us up for is decreased muscle activation, of course, around that particular time, decreased use of our joints, and decreased use of our discs as well. Our body will essentially get more cold, for lack of a better term. And I thought I was still just as strong as I was before, and uh, I can remember it. Like it was yesterday, I was squatting 600, and I always did like, what, 15 reps, 12, 15 reps, somewhere in there. And this day, I was coming up on rep number eight, and I heard a loud pop. And I'm like, what the hell was, what the hell was that? I thought the guy who was spotting me, I thought he had hit me. I'm like, man, I turned around, I'm like, did you just hit me? <laughs> He's like, no, dude, I didn't touch you. I'm like, well, what was that loud pop? <laughs> Now, disc herniations can sometimes have a very distinct mechanism of injury where individuals will feel or actually hear an audible, a popping sensation. We do hear this a lot of times in our clients where they might be deadlifting and they feel a pop, they might be squatting and they feel a pop, or they might just be simply bending over to pick something up and they feel a pop. This is a very, very classic characteristic sign of disc herniations. Now, one additional thing I would like to add is that during periods of time off, we might not be mobilizing our body as much as we were when we are actively moving and exercising. So based on the positions that Ronnie's body was in throughout this time off, if he had an established mobility routine or rehabilitation plan to counteract what that stagnant period was doing on his individual joints that he would be using for his squatting performance, it might have changed the outcome when he went right back into the gym day one after that brief period of time off and then attempted to lift the same amount of weight that he was beforehand. As soon as I said, what was that loud pop? I felt this pain go down my left leg all the way down to my foot. And I'm like, whoa, that hurt. (laughs) 
I'm like, well, I'm done with squatting. Now, what Ronnie is describing is that the disc herniation has pushed enough outwards towards where the nerve exits the spinal cord through the intervertebral foramen. Now, it is pushing on this nerve and therefore is causing these symptoms that he is now feeling down the leg. This is a sign of direct nerve encroachment. And uh, I went and did leg press, uh, hack squats or whatever. I did some hamstrings. I like this clip because Ronnie describes how he continues to finish his workout and continue to perform at the gym. Well, at this point in time, the chances of him making this injury worse are quite low. And so he just simply modified his movement towards things that he felt comfortable doing and that he was able to do. This is not a right or wrong approach. Just simply he modified his movement and the chances of him making it worse at that point in time are quite low because the damage is done at that point. Uh, I put my uniform on, I'm headed to work, and I'm like, wait a minute, my back is still hurting. <laughs> Something must be seriously wrong. So I'm like, I ain't going to work. <laughs> Something wrong with my back, because it ain't going to be hurting this long, you know. So I go to the emergency room. Okay, now at this point, typically the next day when someone has this occurrence with a disc herniation or hurting their back, they will feel quite seized up. Typically, our clients will describe that standing up straight the next morning was difficult to impossible. They feel stuck forward, going to bend forward to put their socks and shoes on, or even sit on the toilet or stand up after sitting on the toilet can be extremely stiff and painful. These are very common symptoms that Ronnie obviously experienced, which discouraged his desire to go into work that particular day. Now, rushing to the emergency room has been shown to not be an effective strategy for lower back disorders, as most people that go to emergency rooms will receive minimal treatment efficiency, but very high cost associated. Emergency rooms are not trained to deal with common neuromusculoskeletal disorders, and typically the experience of these individuals is not favorable. Uh, we did x-ray, we can't find nothing wrong with your back. I'm like, what do you mean you can't find nothing wrong with my back? Why does it hurt me so bad? There you have it. Most emergency rooms do not have a proper triage for how to manage most lower back disorders. They typically have a sequence of tests that they take everybody through that usually racks up a pretty hefty price point without many answers. The method that they started with was an x-ray, probably to look for any signs of fracture, things like that. But based on Ronnie's mechanism of injury, it is quite obvious that this is a disc lesion and x-rays will not show disc herniations or disc bulges on x-ray. These imaging methods just focus on bone, so this would not be the correct imaging modality to use at this point in time. I'm like, well, we don't know. You, you, you probably need to do an MRI or something. I'm like, oh, okay. So at this point, without answers from the x-ray, they determine, okay, let's go to the next imaging modality of choice, which would be an MRI. This will be the correct imaging tool to identify disc lesions. So the next day I went to an uh, MRI place and got an MRI, and they're like, oh, man, you got a, <laughs> you got a herniated disc. Like, I knew something was wrong with my back. Shoot, I ain't supposed to be in that much pain. Now, acute disc herniations can be quite painful, and this goes to show that many people out there are told, oh, we don't see anything wrong on this picture, you're fine, go home, as they did with the x-ray. However, with a more appropriate imaging choice, they might actually identify an injury that is evident. However, one important thing to note is that many people will have many asymptomatic findings on imaging. With x-rays or MRIs, there are many things that will appear it does not always mean that it is the problem necessarily, and this is why an appropriate clinical assessment should always be paired with an imaging tool. Evidence of a disc herniation on an MRI alone is not sufficient to determine if that is what someone's pain is coming from. History and clinical testing needs to be paired with it. However, with Ronnie's history that he is describing, it is quite obvious that this is the injury that is causing his pain. And uh, I, I was in so much pain that uh, I couldn't even go to work. For like two weeks. Another thing is that low back pain is the number one disability in the world, accounting for most days of work lost. Now, one thing that I always like to note here is with two weeks off of work, let's just say for the sake of ease of calculation, let's say you make $1,000 a week. He has already lost $2,000 at this point due to his back pain. A big approach that I always mention is getting the right approach from the start because if you get the right approach early on, you will get back to work sooner, you will get back to feeling pain-free and healthy sooner, and you will literally save thousands of dollars. So off the bat right now, just from not receiving the correct frontline treatment and taking two weeks off of work, he has already lost $2,000 due to this injury. This is important to note because having the right plan of attack from the start 
which we help people do around the world, will immediately save you thousands of dollars in the long run. It came to the point where I, I'm like, man, I got to get my butt off this floor and go back to work <laughs> and get back in this gym because I was getting ready for the Arnold Classic that year. So I go back to the gym and the first thing I do is squats. Now here, Ronnie is describing simply that, hey, I can't keep resting and going on like this. I have to do my job. So I have to get back in the gym and I have to perform and build my legs back up and build my physique back up using the same method of exercise that caused the injury in the first place. But this is his job. This is his life. This is how he makes his money. So it is understandable to know that he's going right back to it. And the most I could get up to was 315. And I'm like, okay, well, at least I can squat that. So I stayed at 315 for a while. And, you know, I could get 10 reps, 15 reps out of it. So I was, I was still happy. Returning to the same exercise, but using a lighter weight for higher reps is an effective way to help the body start to get used to that exercise again and start to re-strengthen that initial area that unfortunately faulted under that load so that the body has time to adapt to this weight and build over time. I remember the doctor saying, man, you could, uh, you can get surgery on this herniated disc, but uh, if you don't want to, you're going to have to do some kind of rehabilitation. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to chiropractor. <laughs> so the doctor has now brought up surgery because Ronnie has identified his inability to get back to the same weight that he was at before. Instead of recommending a more appropriate rehabilitation pathway, he has brought up surgery. Now, Ronnie brings up that he wants to go to his chiropractor first. If this is the same chiropractor that he felt he needed to go to every single day for months and years, I would have recommended otherwise because we need to have a more concrete plan of rehabilitation so that once again, he can address the root of the issue and not have to continue to go back over and over just for pain management. We want everyone we work with to manage their own condition so that they do not need us again. So that's when I went to uh, Dr. Eisen and uh, he... Man, he put me on all these machines and had me doing all this massage therapy. His wife was doing massage therapy, and, and I started feeling a whole lot better. You know, my back got stronger and everything. I was able to work my way back to, you know, 600, you know, for reps and stuff. And So this is great. He was able to receive effective treatment that helped his pain and helped his function. I have nothing negative to say here. Of course, when I hear I was put on a bunch of machines and massage, these are passive therapies. Passive therapies are things that are done to you, not things that you're doing for yourself. We know that active therapy will always result in longer term results and better clinical outcomes. However, at this point in time, he's receiving relief and that's all that matters at this point. I'll go to, I'll go to chiropractor every single day again. You know, that, that, that pretty, much, pretty much saved my career. Fantastic this was able to save his career and that the right person was there for him at that particular point in time to help assist him in that direction. Now, the trick is, will this last long term? We will find out. Did the doctor ever tell you to stop working out? No, no, he never told me to stop working out. They told me to quit doing squats. I'm like, okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first thing I do when I get to the gym, do squats. Now, we have never told one of our clients who has herniated a disc, which is almost exclusively what we work with. We talk to hundreds of people every week with disc issues and sciatica issues. This is all that we do through our rehabilitation program that we walk people through around the world. We have never told people to stop deadlifts or to stop squatting or anything like that. It is excellent to hear that this individual's doctor did not tell him to stop working out because many doctors out there will tell patients to stop working out and that it's terrible advice. Uh, encouraging someone's activity to reduce is never a good thing. However, in this case, they did recommend to not squat anymore, even though, as Ronnie stated, this is part of his job and it is something that he felt he simply needed to do for his career and for his love of doing it. I do not think there's anything wrong with that. If you have the right rehabilitation plan in place, I think everybody should be able to return back to squatting the way that they choose. I worked my way back up to 800 pounds. Congratulations, Ronnie. At this point in time, it sounds like you've made a full recovery and that things are going well, but... And I was squatting and I, I was doing, I, I worked my, my way up to like 500 and I squatted and I felt something in my, my right uh, quad. Next thing I know, uh, my uh, foot started getting numb and, uh, you know, I'd walk these long distances and all of a sudden my foot would just start going numb. I'm like, wait a minute, something's wrong. 
So what Ronnie is describing is a re-herniation of a disc that is now once again causing nerve encroachment, which is causing nerve-based symptoms down the leg. Nerve symptoms can manifest in many ways. It can feel like a pulling sensation, it can be a burning sensation, an electric shock sensation, and numbness and tingling down the leg. Most certainly, Ronnie has now suffered another herniation of his lower back because I believe a proper rehabilitation plan was not in place and simply passive therapies and pain management was what he was working with, but not addressing the root of the issue and changing his function for the long term. So I went to the doctor and he's like, man, we, we might, I think we might need to do surgery on you because uh, that disc is just pushing real hard against your nerve. And as soon as they did that surgery, that pain went away. And I was all right, you know. But uh, that was my first back surgery. So at first glance, it sounds like a successful surgery. Reherniation, tried therapy before, therapy was helpful. However, not this time, perhaps. Let's attempt surgery. That is what most of our healthcare system would then push on us next. Hey, you tried this before, it didn't work, time for surgery. And it sounds as though that surgery initially did reduce the pain significantly, which is great for Ronnie. I'm happy that that was his experience. However, as always, we're looking for the long-term result. So let's see what the future then became after this first surgery. They say uh, once you like pull one of them cans out from under, uh, under then the whole stack starts falling. That's what started happening in my back. Right. My, uh, the rest of my disc started just, you know, going forward. So I had to do another surgery and then another one. Next thing you know, I'm up to like four. What Ronnie is describing is what many do around the world, saying that their lower back surgery worked maybe initially, but not for long term. Only about 30% of lower back surgeries are successful. Many of them require reoperation because what the surgeons believe is that, well, if one did not work, then another one will. However, the evidence does not agree with this. And we see time and time again that the more surgeries that are performed, the lower the chance of success it is. With each consecutive surgery, the chance of positive outcome goes down. This is why surgery is not a good intervention for most lower back issues. After that first surgery, I had to do another one to correct the, the first one, and then I do another one to correct that one. So it, 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 it oh, got to the point where they had to just go in and just put cages around my disc. After so many macrodiscectomies that Ronnie had underdone, now his doctors are telling him, hey, there's no point in continuing macrodiscectomies. Let's perform a lumbar fusion to try to prevent this from occurring further. Many people who undergo a lumbar fusion typically have chronic issues. Yes, of course, there are some cases where it is successful and people feel good after. However, there are many, many reports where that is not their situation. As Ronnie described, one surgery led to another, led to another, led to another, where at this point in time, he has undergone 13 lower back surgeries attempting to reverse the damage from the previous ones. And now we're in a vicious cycle of a catch-22 resulting in surgeries causing problems and then other surgeries trying to reverse those same problems occurred from the previous surgery. This is a cycle that many people find themselves in. And we have actually had clients who have had 10 plus surgeries in our program as well. At this point in time, we have successfully canceled around 600 plus surgeries of our clients who started our program telling us that they were already scheduled for surgery and then canceled their surgery within the first month due to the results that they achieved in our program, which is a non-surgical rehabilitation one-on-one -on -one coaching program for disc and sciatica issues. What I believe is that if Ronnie had received an appropriate rehabilitation plan on the front end instead of passive pain management based therapies, that perhaps the outcome would have been different. Now, this is purely speculation. However, in many of Ronnie's interviews, he does state that was a particular surgery that took them about 13 hours to perform. And ever since that surgery, nothing has ever been the same and he's never been able to get his health back. So he documents himself that these surgeries is where everything went wrong. And this is why we want to overall reduce the number of lumbar surgeries that are occurring because the success rate for them is not good. And we can recover from disc herniations without surgery. The biomedical model, the typical healthcare systems tend to push on us surgery and injections for common lower back injuries all of the time. And the facts 
The evidence shows that this is just not needed a vast majority of the time when you have an appropriate rehabilitation plan that is focused on these types of conditions that can teach you how to fix yourself so you do not need to rely on the healthcare system and you can take these things into your own hands. All you need is just the commitment and the guidance to do so. I wish Ronnie Coleman the best in his continued recovery and his overall life, that he stays in the gym, he continues to do what he loves, and that he can achieve everything he wants to further with the incredible life that he has lived so far. He is truly a legend in the sport, and I wish him and everyone around him the best. Once again, be sure to join my Facebook group, Rehab Fix Low Back Program, so you can get additional exclusive content and our free Sataka guide immediately upon joining. And you can look at the additional upcoming content that we are created just for individuals in that page. If you are watching this on YouTube, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you are listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave a five-star rating and review so we can grow this podcast and help reach more individuals who deserve to get results, who feel like they're spinning their tires and getting frustrated in doing so. As always, move more, move in nature, move in the sun. Thank you so much for listening and have a great day.